Hello, this is Rupinder Sial and welcome to Spartan Tutorials. Today we are going to talk about biotechnology enzymes. The enzymes which have made the biotechnology, recombinant DNA technology and genetic engineering possible. We have covered some of the enzymes, for example CRISPR-Cas9, uh, which is used for genome editing and restriction endonucleases in our previous videos. But today we are going to look at a, basically a toolkit, a list of enzymes which you can use to think about problems, which you can apply in your research as well as in solving questions related to genetic engineering or recombinant DNA technology in the exams. So consider this as a toolkit. So let's get started about the 17 must know biotechnology enzymes. So there are four categories of enzymes that we will be dealing with. The first are nucleases, these degrade DNA or RNA. Then we have ligases, these are used to join DNA molecules or RNA molecules. Then we have polymerases, which are helpful for making new DNA, making new RNA, either single-stranded or double-stranded DNA or RNA. And lastly, we have the modification enzymes. These are typically used to either remove phosphate groups or add phosphate groups or to add methyl groups to the DNA or RNA molecules to help in their cloning or in their analysis. So let's get started. So the first category is nucleases. The first nuclease that we are going to discuss is DNAs1. It stands for deoxyribonuclease 1. It is a pretty non-specific enzyme. It is usually provided as RNA's free preparation by reagent manufacturers. And the double-stranded DNA or any DNA which has overhangs can act as the template for this enzyme. So there are multiple uses of DNAs1. One. one is to generate, for example, genomic DNA free RNA preps. So when we are isolating RNA and we get want to get rid of the genomic DNA or template DNA, then we can use DNAs1. And because it is RNA is free, so the RNA is not harmed. It is also used for DNAs1 footprinting, which we have already covered in one of the previous videos. So if, if you haven't watched that, please check that video out. It is important for finding the binding sites of transcription factors on different DNA sequences. And lastly, it is also used for NIC translation. So NIC translation means making radio labeled or fluorescently labeled probes in the DNA using the polymerase activity. So DNA is one is used to create these cuts and then we can use clinofragment or intact E. coli DNA polymerase one to make these fluorescent or radio labeled probes. So DNA is one has these four different types of uses. Second is exonuclease 3. Exonuclease 3 basically chews up DNA non-discriminately and it is used to generate single-stranded DNA for dideoxy sequencing or what is known as Sanger sequencing. It is a double-strand DNA specific exonuclease. So one important distinction about nucleases is that they can be exonucleases so they chew from the ends of the dna or they can be endonucleases which means that they can cut even inside the fragment so just to give you an example here an exonuclease can target only the ends of the dna molecule whereas an endonuclease can target any of the part of the dna and that's what Restriction endonucleases, which you are most commonly familiar with, they do. They, they can target any DNA fragment present inside a long DNA molecule. The specificity of exonuclease 3 is any double-stranded DNA molecule with either 5' prime overhangs or double-stranded blunt DNA molecule. These two are the substrates for exonuclease 3. Okay, moving on. The third enzyme are type 2 restriction endonucleases or the restriction enzymes as they are commonly known. These are the basic workhorses of cloning and recombinant DNA technology 
and they can be of three different types based on the types of ends that they produce. For example, here we have the enzyme called APA1 and the names of these restriction enzymes usually derive from the host species where they were first isolated. So for example, in case of APA1, it is Acetobacter pasturianus and this is the recognition sequence of this enzyme. So it recognizes this sequence. And here you can see that it is extending the cut at both the DNA fragments towards the three prime end. So what it does is it generates a three prime overhang. So this is a neat trick to remember whether it generates a five prime overhang or three prime overhang. You will get a lot of questions regarding cloning for this and you can solve this by just looking at the overall direction of the overhang. So if this is the restriction enzymes rest recognition sequence, if it is over here towards the three prime end, this is the center, then it will generate three prime overhang. If it is here, then it will generate five prime overhang. And if it is right in the middle, it will generate blunt ended DNA. Then we have BAMH1. So this is the enzyme isolated from Bacillus amyloleukofaciens. And here you can see it will generate five prime overhang. And then we have enzymes like EcoRV uh, isolated from E. coli and these generate blunt ends. Pretty hard to clone, but it is used in cloning anyways. All right. Then we have RNase A. It is a ribonuclease, so it degrades RNA. And it degrades single-stranded RNA at the C and U residues. So here you can see the effect of treatment of an RNA molecule using RNase A. So wherever they are, there are pyrimidines because both C and U, they are pyrimidine nucleotides. So they will cut over there. So RNase A is used for removing RNA from genomic DNA preps. Usually it is provided as a DNA's free component. Another type of RNAs is called RNAs H. So it has a slightly different specificity. It can recognize RNA DNA hybrids and specifically degrade RNA. So it is very useful in cDNA synthesis where we want to get rid of the RNA and then synthesize the second DNA fragment. All right, moving on. Number six, S1 nuclease. So S1 nucleases is, has been very useful in transcriptional start site mapping. It is a single strand specific nuclease. It degrades DNA or RNA, which is single stranded. So usually what people have done in the past is use them. First, they isolate mRNA and then use a radio labeled probe to hybridize it to the mRNA and then chew up the hybrid with S1 nuclease so that all the single stranded fragment is digested and it is destroyed and we are left with only the hybrid part and the difference between the length of this full length probe and the digested probe gives us an idea about the location of the transcription start site. Hugely important because we still have no algorithm or unique sequence for transcription start sites. So it has been immensely useful in transcription start site mapping. Nowadays, we have better technologies like RNA-seq, but in the early days of uh, recombinant DNA technology and molecular biology, S1 nuclease mapping was the gold standard for TSS mapping. Okay, coming to enzyme number seven, which is BAL31 exonuclease. This is a DNA and RNA specific exonuclease. And as we already talked about different exonucleases, they can target from the both the ends of the DNA molecule. So it is repeat, routinely used for progressive shortening of DNA ends. So if we want a smaller DNA fragment, if you want to chew it up, use it for cloning or for other purposes, then BAL31 exonuclease is used. Okay, coming to ligases, and here we have just one ligase, which is the T4 DNA ligase, hugely important, although there is only one, this is isolated from 
phage T4. So it catalyzes the phosphodiester bond formation between two DNA strands. So it is used for ligation and cloning. Okay, now we come to polymerases. The first polymerase is Clino fragment of DNA Pol1. Clino fragment was isolated back in the 1970s as kind of a C terminal fragment of E. coli DNA Pol1. The N terminus and the C terminus fragment were isolated after treating it with subtilism. The N terminus has the 5 prime to 3 prime exonuclease activity and the C terminus has 3 prime to 5 prime exonuclease activity. So the Clino fragment is used for blunt ending a DNA molecule. So if we have a DNA molecule which has 3 prime overhang using 3 prime to 5 prime exonuclease activity, it can be used to make it blunt. So there is no overhang and it can be used for cloning. So it has other uses also. It is also used for generating probes using random primers, which we will talk about in a later video. And it is also used for second strand cDNA synthesis because it retains its polymerase activity. So it has the polymerase activity and 3' prime to 5' prime exonuclease activity. And that leads to formation of these blunt ends. And it is also used for the second strand DNA, cDNA synthesis. Enzyme number 10, E. coli DNA Pol1, hugely important, it is used for NIC translation. So this is the complete enzyme from the Clino fragment. Clino fragment is just the C-terminal part, but this is the complete DNA polymerase 1. This is not the main DNA polymerase. So in the past, it has been used for NIC translation and second strand cDNA synthesis. All right. So these are the two uses of E. coli DNA Pol1. Okay, coming to the superstar of molecular biology and microbiology, first isolated by Thomas Brock in Yellowstone National Park of USA, TAC DNA polymerase. It is isolated from Thermus aquaticus. And you can see the scanning electron micrograph picture of this bacterium right here. This is a thermostable DNA polymerase. It is stable at high temperatures. So it, it can be used to carry out PCR very easily. Earlier, the PCR reactions used to be done by replenishing at every cycle. So we had to provide fresh DNA polymerase at every cycle because it used to get deactivated. TAC DNA polymerase really revolutionized PCR and DNA forensics and all the aspects of molecular biology. So a workhorse of molecular biology, very useful. Nowadays, there are better DNA polymerases available also from extremophilic organisms, which have better fidelity and uh, much less error rate as compared to TAC DNA polymerase. But still for colony PCR and routine PCR uses, TAC DNA polymerase is the go-to enzyme. All right, number 12, T7 DNA polymerase. This is isolated from phage T7 and this is used in site directed mutagenesis when we want to make the second strand of DNA. So in a future video, I will definitely talk about site directed mutagenesis. In the meantime, you can check your textbooks and see how second strand DNA synthesis is carried out. T7 DNA polymerase is used for that. Okay, number 13, T7 and T3 RNA polymerases. And I would like to add actually SP6 RNA polymerase also. These are three RNA polymerases which are extensively used for in vitro transcription reactions and for making lots of RNA which can be further used for in vitro translation. Okay, so making radioactive probes or fluorescent probes or antisense RNA probes, T7 and T3 RNA polymerases are used as well as the SP6 RNA polymerase. So very strong promoters and very high fidelity enzymes. So they are used routinely for these purposes. Okay, enzyme number 14, reverse transcriptase. Reverse transcriptase we just discussed in our recent video about detection of COVID-19 by real-time RT-PCR. And RT there stands for this enzyme called reverse transcriptase. What it does is it converts RNA to DNA. Specifically, it is known as cDNA. And here you can see the mechanism. 
So we use it to generate first strand cDNA synthesis using reverse transcriptase. Then we degrade the RNA using RNA's H and then we synthesize the second strand of DNA and it leads to amplification later on. You can use it for PCR. So reverse transcriptase is used to convert RNA to cDNA. So it is used in in vitro diagnostics as well as in RTQPCR. All right, number 15, terminal transferase. Terminal transferase is an important enzyme. It is used in tunnel assay as well as specific PCR methods which use terminal transferase. And what terminal transferase does is it is a non-specific nucleotide adding enzyme. So it is a polymerase, but it adds any nucleotide without the need for any template to the three prime end. So it is very much used for tunnel assays as well as making longer DNA or making labeled DNA. For example, biotinylated nucleotides are added to the mixture and those can be added to the DNA molecules and they can be used as probes. So terminal transferase is also pretty useful. And lastly, we have the modifying enzymes. In the modifying enzymes, first we have enzyme number 16, alkaline phosphatase. Alkaline phosphatase removes the 5' prime phosphate groups from DNA. This is important if we want to generate probes using NIC translation and using T4 polynucleotide kinase, as well as if we want to prevent the circularization of vectors. So this is commonly used that if we have insert and vector, we use alkaline phosphatase usually derived from calf intestine. So it is also sometimes known in the lab as SIP treatment. CIP stands for calf intestinal phosphatase. And there are other versions also, Antarctic phosphatase, shrimp phosphatase. These are available from manufacturers. And what we do is we dephosphorylate either insert or vector, and this prevents them to recircularize or ligate with each other so that only insert vector combinations can form. So it dramatically improves the efficiency of cloning. All right. Okay, drum roll. And now we are at the last enzyme, which is the T4 polynucleotide kinase. This is used to add the gamma phosphate into the five prime end of the DNA, especially one which lacks that. So already it has been treated with, for example, alkaline phosphatase. So it is used for making labeled DNA molecules. Okay. So these are the 17 must know molecular biology or biotechnology, genetic engineering, whatever you want to call it. Those enzymes that we routinely use in the labs. I think every modern lab uses some combinations of these enzymes and it is very important to remember the function as well as uses of these enzymes in your research as well as for your examinations. Okay, so I hope you found this video useful. Please give it a thumbs up if, if you liked it and do subscribe to my channel for more educational videos like this. Till the next time we meet, take care and bye-bye.